Hi, this is Tim of the Watch Box. Welcome aboard and thanks for logging on. Saturday starts now and we're waking up with watches. If you want to purchase any watch in today's show, they are all for sale. Reach out to tmasso at thewatchbox.com. And of course, we are always looking to buy inventory. This really is do or die time for the holidays and we are trying to build up as many watches in stock as possible for the big day. Reach out to me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com, if you want to sell or trade a watch, your online concierge for all things watches. Let's jump straight in with three extraordinary timepieces by F.P. Journe. We're going to start with the man in the middle. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'll hold that one till the last. Maybe we'll make it a surprise. Let's start with a watch that represents an awful lot of value in what could effectively be called vintage F.P. Journe. So let's see if my camera can pick this up a little bit closer. No, it can't. Okay, not a problem. I'm going to zoom in and showcase this 38 millimeter platinum F.P. Journe Octachronograph rose gold dial, 38 millimeter platinum case, a model that features a combination of a flyback chronograph and a big date with an automatic winding five-day power reserve. It is chock-a-block with features. You can see the bezels framing the gold matte port portions of the dial, black polished steel, flip it all over. And you can see that this is brass movement era F.P. Journe. The case has a year manufacture code of 03. That means the case itself was made in 03. In general, there's a fairly close correspondence between the year of the watch's manufacture and the case's year of fabrication. As you can see, you have the Eleanor Maker's mark on the case and the hallmarks of both Switzerland and France because the case would have been made in France before being shipped to Geneva for assembly as a watch. So brass era F.P. Journe caliber, that means we have brass bridges and plates with rhodium plating on top, free sprung, five position adjusted, 21 six beat rate, a watch that has a feature I adore on chronographs, a 60 minute register rather than a 30 minute register. There is a quick set for the double digit date and this 30 millimeter watch wears beautifully as it's nice and compact, only 44.5 millimeters from lug to lug, it fits on any wrist. Now taking a quick look at another watch that is discontinued and had a very short production run. The one year only 2019 Chronomet Resonance is the watch that many collectors seek when they desire the symmetry of the Resonance 1 and the Resonance 2, but with the 24 hour second time zone functionality of the Resonance 3. And you get that here. One dial is 24, one dial is 12, but we do away with the scrolling time display of the Resonance 3. This dial with blue printing was only made as you see it for the 2019 model year, but there's more. 40 millimeters in platinum, this is the black label edition. So not only a one year model, but a model made exclusively for F.P. Journe factory boutiques, and then only for prior purchasers of F.P. Journe watches. And then in addition, there was a limit on how many examples of any given model could be made black label per year. So this is a scarce watch. It is the chronomet resonance, which means you've got two movements in one case, barrel, train, escapement, balance. They're coupled solely by harmonic resonance, which means they beat in opposition but they are synchronized to within five seconds per day. So if due to vibration or position or a knock or concussion, one speeds up or slows down, the other one will auto-correct it. The system was a world premiere by F.P. Journe when first launched in a wristwatch back in 2000. Now it takes about seven to 10 minutes for the two sides to couple together by resonance. So you'll find that the two second hands often aren't synchronized, not a problem. There's a flyback for fixing exactly that. These two dials can be set separately. We have a power reserve of four 40 hours. It is a bullhead setter and winder, and the watch wears easily, though I will mention with a platinum case and a rose gold movement, it's a satisfyingly weighty and substantial 40 millimeter watch. You can see it's low and flat. It'll fit underneath the dress cuff, and I can even endorse it as a unisex option as it's only 48 millimeters from lug to lug. Now, a lot of folks say they like independent brands, but most of these brands seem to be uninsurable or risky. And the two exceptions to that often are H. Moser and C. and F. P. Journ. Moser, out of Schaffhausen, has been under the guidance of the Melan family, which is an old watchmaking Swiss family since 2012. And they've become something like the German Swiss F. P. Journ, making 1,500 watches a year. They are a full manufacturer, even making the tough parts of a watch, such as escapements, balances, and hairsprings. This is the Heritage Center 2nd, 
a watch that's designed to evoke officer-style watches as well as early aviation and observer timepieces. It's 42 millimeters in stainless steel with wire-style lugs. Throw it on the wrist, you can see it's nicely sized. 42 millimeters, but with those wire-style lugs, it wears a little bit more compact, more like, I would say, a 39 or a 40. It's not too thick. It's got a nicely domed case flank. You can see there's a little bit of coining in the case flank, that ridged profile that you see. The watch also includes a domed bezel and an onion-style crown, as you would see in antiquity. The dial is Moser's Funky Blue, and it's their color with their signature fume fade from light at the center to dark at the edge. Now, if you look carefully, you can see that the numerals are actually solid blocks of Luminova. So the watch actually has an incredible loom shot. One of the few officer-style watches that includes a loom of any kind, and the fact that it has a sports watch movement in a steel case makes it even more appropriate for everyday use. You can see it uses a magic lever bi-directional style winding system, and for durability it has a full balance bridge and a free sprung index, a 21 6 beat rate, a three-day power reserve, and hacking or stop seconds so you can set it precisely. Now, the other company building watches out of Schaffhausen, Switzerland, alongside Moser, is a little bit better known for it. And in 1985, IWC Schaffhausen redoubled its commitment to mechanical watchmaking with this. The IWC Da Vinci Perpetual Calendar Chronograph, reference 3750. It is a lovely timepiece that includes Vendôme-style pivoted lugs, and you can see this one features a pre-1995 hallmark, so it would have been made between 85 and 95. One of the advantages of buying the earlier series is that you get an authentic tritium dial, which is what you have right here. You have a white gloss lacquer base for the dial and a venturine moon phase disc. Let's see, let me fire this one up with a few winds. It includes a chronograph automatic winding and a 48-hour power reserve. This one features a French-language perpetual calendar, and one of the nice features of the IWC Kurt Klaus design perpetual calendar is that you have a quick set system, and everything is synced together. The decade, the year, the day, the day, the month, all of that and the moon phase. And as you make the adjustments with the quick set, as easy as you would with a Rolex date just, Everything moves in sync, mechanically programmed. So thanks to IWC watchmaker Kurt Klaus, you never need to look up, for example, the current moon phase. Just set the correct date for the month you're in, and you're good. Automatic winding, perpetual calendar, aventurine moon phase, chronograph, tritium dial, vintage watch. It, it's true, this is a vintage watch. All that, and it has a wonderfully wearable size with a handsome vintage-style plexiglass crystal, so you get that vintage watch aesthetic, a timepiece that's not terribly thin, but nicely sloped on its case flanks, so it'll fit underneath the cuff. These 3750s are among the absolute best buys in vintage complicated watchmaking. Jumping forward to the modern day, this is a watch that was released in late 2019 for the 2020 model year, and it's been called the James Bond edition, the No Time to Die, but officially it is the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter 007 edition. A couple of elements that are designed to evoke Omega's long-running history with the British Ministry of Defense, not fictional with James Bond, but in fact, especially during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, here you can see that we have the broad arrow or chevron logo of the MOD, and a few other items need to be called to attention. This is a no-date version of the Diver 300 meter, and it has an aluminum bezel insert with an aluminum tropical-style faded dial. So the design is uh, intended to evoke an aged 1960s Omega Seamaster that would have been issued to the British Ministry of Defense. Now, you can see the whole case is satin finished, so there's no polish here. And unlike the standard Diver 300 meter, it has a solid case back with Ministry of Defense style engravings. And you can see there are a few nods to 007, of course, 007 and 62, the year of the first official James Bond movie. Because of the solid case back, the watch is also half a millimeter thinner than the standard Diver 300 meter. We have a full titanium mesh bracelet, but unlike a conventional mesh, mesh bracelet, which generally has to be sized, this one features perforations and gussets and a conventional pin buckle inside the clasp. You can see there's a little locking mechanism built in with ceramic pin snaps. So you put the opposite side of the bracelet into this clasp, you lock it in place, then you close, and all excess length is tucked underneath the bracelet. So it actually works exactly like a strap, even though it is a bracelet. A German company, Steib Manufacturing, 
manufactures these bracelets and it cuts them from full cloth of woven titanium. It's very impressive. The watch has a 120 click bezel, a 55 hour power reserve. It is effectively a magnetic, 300 meters water resistant, shock resistant, and equipped with a helium escape valve if you are a saturation diver. Now, one of the advantages of the aluminum bezel is that the full bezel can be loomed. Have a listen to the ratchet. It's a nice sharp 120 click. Line up the bezel pearl with the James Bond style skeleton hands and you can see it's easy to read the progression of time because you can quickly judge the relative to positions of the minute hand and the bezel pearl. Technically impressive, very durable, very accurate, and very, very attractive. And again, it's an aluminum insert for the bezel and an aluminum dial. Look closely and you can see that the hands are anthracite gray metallic and they've been individually brushed and satinated across their top. It is a very appealing watch. Now let's say you want to go a little bit upscale with your sports watch, sticking within the house of Swatch and the Swatch Group. Here we have the discontinued and much loved Breguet Big Date 5817, and this is the rose gold model, lots to love. 39 millimeter case, over 100 meters water resistant, 65 hour power reserve, and you can see the movement, which is Frederic Piguet based, is handsomely hand finished, including a lovely Nautilus shell pattern that is cut with a rose lathe into the winder. You can see that the finishing is world class. It's five position adjusted, like a chronograph. There's impressive Cote de Genève blackening of the screws, mirrored anglage, which you can see to good advantage from this angle. And of course, you have the engraving of the rotor. The case flank is cold rolled and then hand finished, and you can see the lugs are welded on and impressively massive. There's an integrated strap, so you don't see any daylight between case and strap, and then bars and screws are used to fix the strap to the case. The watch is a sports watch. Again, automatic winding, rubber strap, over 100 meters water resistant, and quite well loomed by night. You can see that the indices are green and the hands are blue. Now about that dial, the dial is cut on a rose lathe. This is guilloché by hand, which is why you see guilloché mat down at the bottom of the dial. So hand guilloché on a solid gold dial base. Only after the solid gold disc has been cut do they then galvanize it a combination of tobacco brown and silver with the rose gold brigade, or I should say in this case, brigade hands and Roman numerals applied. And if you look carefully, you can see that the printing on the date disc is blue for a nice warm contrast. We have a very deluxe set of hardware with strap minders in solid gold and then a full rose gold deployment clasp. You can see the wave motif recurring across the watch. It's in the design of the buckle. It's in the design of the strap minders. It's in the design of the crown guard. It's in the design of the dial. And you can see it's in the design of the rotor on the case back. So a lot to love. The watch wears fairly large for a 39 because of the immense span of the lugs. Think of this as more as a 41 or a 42 and you get the general idea. I would recommend it for a wrist as small as 15 centimeters in circumference. On a full strap, this is a real nice alternative to something like a Patek Aquanaut, which is neither better built nor more accurate. This is a fine timepiece from a hugely underrated high horology brand. Now, let's say you're shopping for a high-luxury watch, and you're on more of a JLC budget, but you want holy trinity refinement and street cred, and you, you get that with all the patrimony and the heritage and the value of the Vacheron name in the 56 self-windings. This watch, 40 millimeters in stainless steel. The line came out in 2018. This blue dial variant came out in 2019. A very, very handsome timepiece that's versatile and loosely based on the vintage reference 6073. The only real reference to the vintage watch is in these little peaks, these little peaked horns on each end of the lug. Otherwise, it's a completely original design with applique indices and numerals. You can see it has a blue date disc on a blue dial. Every watch should be so thoughtfully detailed. And though it is a dress watch, it does have plenty of luminescence and a steel case and automatic winding. So it's a pretty versatile dress watch. Twin barrels, automatic wind, 48 hour power reserve, caliber 1326 is a Richemont Group corporate movement. You'll find it from other brands such as Cartier, but it's been handsomely executed for use in this Vacheron, and it comes with a completely unique hand-finished 22 karat golden mass. This rotor is shared with no other version of this movement in the Richemont Group. It's a nice, fairly thin watch with a substantial presence, so though it's a dress watch, it doesn't appear petite. And being made of steel, automatic winding, and well-loomed, this is an everyday companion. It's not a dress watch 
only for those occasions when you plan to quote unquote dress up. This is a timepiece with a lot of presence and it can go toe to toe with any Calatrava in terms of total aesthetic appeal, durability, and manufacturing quality. But let's say you have an even more focused goal, which is to get something that is outside the mainstream, not just affordably priced. And with Grand Seiko and this SBGY007, you have that. This is the Omawatari watch, which is essentially a watch dedicated to the look of ice on the surface of Lake Sua, which is near the Shinshu Watch Studio, where the Spring Drive Grand Seiko watches are assembled. So you've heard of the snowflake from Grand Seiko. That evokes the snow drifts outside of Shinshu. Here we have the look of the ice on the lake as it freezes in the winter, the rippling ridges of ice and snow, as well as the light blue coloration. The watch is exceptionally handsome, super easy to wear at 38.5 millimeters. You have hand finishing the case. Everything that's polished is polished by hand against a spinning tin plate. This is the Zoratsu case finish for which Grand Seiko is known. The mid case is thin and the profile is flat. And the watch is designed to be part of the Elegance collection from Grand Seiko, and it certainly is that, the Spring Drive Handwind SBGY007. The Omowatari watch is gorgeous, a no-date dial, and for folks who like Spring Drive but don't like the conventional power reserve dial of the Spring Drive watches, your ship has come in. It wears easily underneath the cuff, and it's nice and narrow across the wrist, so you're gonna find it's only about 44 millimeters across the wrist. So this is a narrow watch that's suitable for men or women. And taking a look at the dial, you can see that the seconds hand glides smoothly as this is Spring Drive. There's no stepping to the seconds hand because there is no lever escapement. It's accurate to 15 seconds a month. It's a combination of mechanical watchmaking and quartz timekeeping. You can see that the seconds hand is also fired blue steel, and then the minute and the hour hand, as well as the indices, these are actually finished on diamond-tipped milling tools operated manually by folks who just create these parts all day long for Grand Seiko. You can see the sharp fastening of the Dauphine hands at center, and the fact that all facets are beautifully mirrored. The pieces on this dial, the dial furniture, finished like cut gems. Turn it all over. You can see this is a rare manual wine spring drive. Grand Seiko logo ghosted onto the back. Caliber 9R31, manual wind, case back power reserve indicator, three day power reserve. You can see the unidirectional governing wheel spinning underneath beautifully satin finished bridges. It is a semi hand finished movement, not quite as hand finished as Crador, but more hand finished than a standard 9R65, for example. So this watch features uh, the spring drive technology that derives all of its motion from the spring. There are no motors, there are no batteries, there are no capacitors in this watch. The motion of the spring drives the governing wheel, which creates an induced electrical current that wakes up a quartz oscillator, which then provides feedback in the form of electromagnetic forces to accelerate or break the governing wheel. And then the governing wheel is geared to the barrel and the opposite side of that gear train from the governing wheel is geared to the hands. So the drive of the hands is all mechanical. And the watch even includes a full deployant clasp, so you know you won't accidentally drop your Lake Sua dial when you are donning it or removing it at bedtime. When speaking of value and complications, it's important to note that we can find value and complications in the past as well as the present. And Tag Heuer offers what might be the most compelling package in its price range. At under $20,000 used, this titanium and carbon fiber 500 piece limited edition Tag Heuer Carrera Tourbillon Black Phantom is incredibly compelling. Look at everything you get. A limited edition watch with forged carbon bezel and forged carbon lugs, the distinctive and immortal Carrera lug form, thrusting, angular, defining the case shape. You get an automatic winding, flying tourbillon, a one minute tourbillon that is free sprung. You get a column wheel, vertical clutch chronograph. You get a COSC chronometer certification, or pardon me, I believe it is a time lab chronometer certification. And then on the reverse side, you get a display case back where you can see the caliber Hoyer 02T for which you paid and make no mistake, you can see it. It has been entirely blackened. It's an automatic winder with an impressive 65 hour power reserve. And despite the fact that this watch uses a blacked out semi-skeleton dial. By night, it is quite well loomed and it's 100 meters water resistant, making this watch automatic, water resistant, super light, and well loomed. A true sports watch before we get to its 
chronograph, tourbillon, and chronometer street cred. The watch is large. At 45 millimeters, you need a big wrist for it, and I would recommend a wrist no smaller than mine. My wrist is 16 centimeters in circumference, but it is a very light watch, being all titanium, carbon, and sapphire. What's better than a Vacheron Constantin overseas? Two overseas. Both the self-winding model. This is the original 1996 design, reference 42042. And when launched, it was designed by Vincent Kaufman and Dino Modolo, inspired by the historic York Heisick penned 1977 Vacheron 222. This watch launched Vacheron into the luxury sports watch class in the modern era. And this dial, known as the military dial, is one of the most appealing and, with full loom, one of the most legible day or night. Now, while the watch is technically a 37 millimeter case and about 8.5 millimeters thick, it wears a little bit larger than a 37 on the wrist. You'll note that this generation, and only this generation, made from 96 to 2003, certified as a COSC chronometer later overseas, as well as all Royal Oaks and Nautilus, would lack the chronometer certification. And underneath the case back, water resistant down to 150 meters, we have a caliber 1311, which is a chronometer certified Vacheron finished and regulated Girard Perigo 3000 series movement. So it has a high horology chronometer movement inside and perhaps the most intricately and finely finished bracelet ever fitted to an overseas. The generation one was the high watermark for intricate detailing and laborious hand finishing. As you can see, even the undersides of these links have been black polished and mirrored, which is truly special to see. Uh, the bracelet has a wonderful set of tolerances. It's, it's got a little bit of play, so it doesn't feel rigid on the wrist, but it has immense structural integrity to remind you this is a sports watch. These were, until the ultra-thin model in white gold, the thinnest ever overseas watches. And it has the image of the Italian naval training vessel Amerigo Vespucci on the case back. If you've ever wondered what that ship is, it's a real world ship. It's an Italian naval training vessel. And that vessel is considered to be one of the most beautiful traditionally square rigged vessels in the world. Though the watch is a 37, I consider it more of a 39. So if you want to compare this to the likes of the Royal Oak Jumbo, or more logically, the Royal Oak 15300, this is a really good cross comparison. Also, if you want hacking seconds on your overseas self winding this is the way to go as the newer watch that you're about to see has everything except hacking seconds now taking a look at that newer watch it's spectacular launched in 2016 this is the third generation overseas and you'll appreciate the fact that though it is larger it's also finer and more capable still 150 meters water resistant thanks to a soft iron ring around the movement it's also 25,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetic automatic winding Geneva hallmark for the first time in an overseas automatic we have an in-house caliber. You have a quick set system for the date. The 60-hour reserve is solidly above the standard in the class. Remember, the Nautilus is still a 45-hour power reserve. We have a dial here in satin silver with black and white gold hands and indices that makes this, in all likelihood, the most legible of the current Generation 3 overseas automatics. Plenty of loom by night, no shortage there. And we have a quick release system for the bracelet. The watch comes with two straps, one in leather and one in rubber with a separate steel deployant clasp so you can quickly and easily change the look of the watch using this pull tab quick release system on the bottom. Now it actually helps you to get a good look at the movement. Caliber 5100 is entirely in-house and finally big enough to fill the case back. Geneva Hallmark finish that speaks for itself and then a rotor that features no fewer than four hand-laid types of finishing as we have polishing we have chiseling we have a satination and then we have a frosting between the chiseling and the satination and it's a 22 carat mass not 21 not 18 and definitely not tungsten a good looking watch with geneva hallmark finishing of case and dial and movement as of mid-2012 it has been a full watch standard of finish now taking a look at the bracelet you can see every individual link on both sides is removable so you're going to get the right size. You also have a micro link built in on both sides of the clasp. You can collapse it just as easily. That allows you to really fine tune the fit and then a double deployant trigger actuated clasp opening. Okay. 
I don't show many vintage watches on this program because it's not a big part of our business. And I'm not a Rolex fanboy, but sometimes a vintage Rolex watch that's just so beautifully preserved and charismatic will show up and I'll be compelled to share it. Uh, this is a low 5 million serial Rolex Oyster Perpetual Sea Dweller, the Submariner 2000 a timepiece that is sometimes known as the double red, and for those keeping score, this is a generation four double red sea dweller dial with a lovely symmetrical pumpkin fade to the hands as well as the dial. The dial is showing no evidence of contact by tools, no water intrusion, no oxidation or tarnishing. It's faded beautifully and naturally. There's no patina here posing, uh, nothing that would be considered damage misrepresented as character. This is genuine patina. It's an honestly aged watch that is remarkably original, not just of dial, but also of case. As you can see, the recesses for the spring bars are quite deep on all sides, and the original factory bevels are still partly intact, not on one corner or two, but on all four corners. Of course, the Sea Dweller, reference 1665, with the helium escape valve on the flanks, a lovely bubble-like set of not sapphire, plexiglass. This was before the sapphire era, and it's wonderfully thick. A nice feature of most sea dwellers, right up to the 43, was the absence of a cyclops eye magnifier that keeps things symmetrical and handsome. The bezel insert is a replacement, as you can see. The bezel insert is the only part of the watch that is Luminova. Now, for the first few seconds, the dial glows, but then you watch the dial rather quickly fades away because it's tritium, and tritium has a half-life of about 12.4 years, and then the bezel remains bright. The bezel is the only part of the watch that is contemporary, being Luminova painted. Now, the watch wears beautifully on the wrist. Inside, it's caliber 1575, the date version of the caliber 1570, which means you do get a lot of modern features like stop seconds, a chronometer certification, a free sprung balance, and an overcoil hairspring. But it's also a little bit anachronistic as it doesn't feature a quick set date. It has a beat rate of 19,800 vibrations per hour. It has a single sided balance cock, not a balance bridge, and it's a 27 joule movement rather than the modern 31. Nevertheless, it does run and keep time like a modern modern Rolex watch, though I advise against using it as a diver, and that's that's general to every vintage dive watch. I just don't think you should get them wet. You have plenty of options, affordable options too, if you wish to dive with a watch today. This watch is all about the period character. It's all about condition, right down to details like the fold-out extension if you do want to use it. I wouldn't recommend over a dive suit, but a vintage dive watch can be used over a thick winter coat or sweater, so the dive extension still has a role even in 2020. This is an outstanding 4th Series dial double red sea dweller that has lots of love left to give to a modern day owner who understands vintage and can appreciate this watch for what it is, an original survivor. Oh, and guess what? Box and papers. Now I promised to bring in that FP Journe announced earlier and sight unseen off camera launched at least as far back as 2014, but scarcely made. This is the FP Journe Tourbillon Souverain Jade Dial. So it's a 40 millimeter platinum Tourbillon Souverain of the model that debuted in 2004 and actually won big at the GPHG shortly thereafter. So this is a GPHG Laureate, but with the Jade Dial, it goes above and beyond. A dial scarcely made because Francois Paul doesn't want it slowing down production at his company. The rejection rate for these jade dials was high. And as you can see, it's fashioned essentially in two parts. There's the one at the top and the one at the bottom. And it is real jade, not just jade color. You can also see that the printing on the dial is off-white so as not to make for a harsh contrast. Otherwise, mechanically, it is the 2004 through uh, 2000. 18 tourbillon souverain and it's a lovely watch with a one minute tourbillon that's free sprung with an overcoil a filigree style wire tourbillon cage a, a 21 6 beat rate and as you can see it has a fully black polished half bridge the screw heads are black polished and then there's beveling on the edge of the tourbillon wire frame elements the power reserve as with all fp Journe chronometer style watches that are either the tourbillon or have the name chronomet in their name 
Power reserve moves backwards, like a vintage marine chronometer to indicate zero when fully wound. We have a deadbeat second, then we also sort of have scrolling seconds, as the tourbillon is a one-minute tourbillon, you can use it as a seconds hand. On the reverse side, you can see the secret to this watch is accuracy. It's not the tourbillon, it's the remontoir de Galité, a linear titanium spring that slips off its own separate escapement once every second to ensure that for the first 28 hours of runtime from a full power reserve, the tourbillon balance maintains constant amplitude. So as long as you wind this watch once a day at the same time every day, it will maintain constant amplitude. And it's the remontoir system, the six position adjustment, the free sprung architecture, and the overcoil, not the tourbillon specifically, that allows this watch to achieve such precision. The movement is made of gold, the case is made of platinum, the dial is made of jade, and this really is the brass ring for that generation of the Tourbillon Souverain, even above and beyond the black label, the Jade Tourbillon is the one to own. And this is one of my favorite FP Journe watches. It's this, it's the Holland in Holland, and it's the black label Chronomet Optimum. Done. This one's gonna move fast, by the way. But I will not oversell FP Journe in a world where Grubel 4C exists. Whereas a subscription Tourbillon from F.P. Journe, his first ever watch made under his own name, will sell between 1 and 2 million. This Grubel 4C double Tourbillon 30 degree, the first Grubel 4C product from 2005, is less than a $400,000 watch. And whereas we often talk of the early F.P. Journe watches as charming in that they are somewhat crude and visibly handmade, Grubel 4C can do better, have a watch that's perfectly handmade from the beginning with no flaws. Using the highest standards of finish and detail in the industry, Grubel and Forsey launched with the goal of creating innovative watches finished like nothing else. Well, maybe not like nothing else, as Philippe Dufour was working back in 2005, and I rate this on par with his work. Now, it's a bigger, bolder watch. Starting with the case, Robert Grubel handles the style, Stephen Forsey handles the tech, and you could see that Robert decided that he was going to reference the oscillator inside the case with a sine wave that wraps all the way around circumferentially. We also have these lovely concave lugs that have a little bit of an inward inflection, and that's a subtle feature to this massive watch that gets lost if you just look at it from the front. It's 43.5 millimeters in white gold, but I can actually wear it in spite of its size. It's massive, and it feels massive, but it's not a big bully as the lugs are relatively short and tightly downturned. I would say if your wrist is my size, 16 centimeters or smaller, you're going to find this watch is a really good match. Now, the first Grubel 4C watch had a simple proposition. Aside from uncompromising, industry-leading breakthrough levels of finish, we would get a tourbillon that did what Breguet intended, help the watch keep better time. So the double tourbillon 30 degree is exactly what its name implies. The inner tourbillon, which is angled at 30 degrees, makes a one minute circuit. The outer tourbillon, which has this little quad spoke serpentine, that makes one circuit every four minutes. So the idea is that even sitting on your table at night on your dresser, one tourbillon at 30 degrees is going to be spinning with some opposition to gravity, and it has that second axis of rotation, so that the tourbillon is always in a complex pirouette to ensure it will cancel out the effects of gravity on the hairspring. Hairsprings are not perfectly centered in their mass. As a result, they will tend to gain speed in certain positions and lose speed in others. Grubel Forsey's answer to that problem, because a pocket watch sits vertical, but a wrist watch sits in many positions, Grubel Forsey allows this multi-axial pirouette to regain the gravity-defying intent of the pocket watch tourbillon. Because remember, a pocket watch always sits at one angle with respect to gravity, so a tourbillon pivoting perpendicular to gravity is always going to be canceling out the effect of gravity. On a wristwatch, you don't have that predictability, but especially at night on your dresser, this one does even out the effects of gravity. Other refinements. Well, it's nicely braced on a full balance bridge. It has an overcoil hairspring shaped by hand with an inner and an outer curve, which helps to bring the mass of the hairspring as close to the balance staff as possible. It's also free sprung and adjusted in six positions, which means there's no position in which the watch can run at a deviant pace. A lot of watches, even those certified as chronometers, will be adjusted in five positions, and generally the crown up or crown down position, which is the most challenging, is the position in which the watch will not 
be tested and in which the watchmakers will hide all the crap, so to speak. With Grubel 4C, there is no place to hide the crap. Now you can see the dial is beautiful and silvered, but it's made of solid gold. The hands are fired blue. We have a white gold scale for the power reserve, which courtesy of twin mainspring barrels is an impressive uh, 72 hours despite the double tourbillon. Turn it all over. And the movement is a tribute to the pocket watch era of watch manufacture in Le Chaux de Fond, where Grubel 4C is based. As a result, we have this lovely gilded finish. We have pivot jewels set in golden chiton. We have enormous blued screws, as would have been used in the pocket watch era. We have more black polishing and more chiton on the underside of the tourbillon carriage. And you can see that outer four minute tourbillon turning away. We also have frosting of the barrel bridge. This is done with a wire brush, the old fashioned way. And not done by media blasting, it's done by dabbing the bridge with something very similar to a cleaning brush as you'd use on a grill for cooking. That steel wire brush creates the indentations that you see. We also have mile wide unglage, beautiful satination on all the wheels, and even inside the wheels you can see that the spokes and inner circumference hand beveled. Again, no detail left unturned. Everything about this watch represented the best in the world then and still the best in the world now. This foundational pioneering piece from Grubel Forcey, not just their first First model ever, not just their breakthrough watch, but a milestone watch for the industry as a whole, and someday the independent watch collecting fraternity will recognize its importance. You can get ahead of the curve and ahead of the trend by reaching out to TMOSO at thewatchbox.com to order yourself an early holiday present. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.